My name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a cardiologist in New York. Today's video is on the subject of heart attacks. As many of you have probably come to know, the whole of India is in mourning. Two days ago, one of its brightest film stars, Siddharth Shukla, died suddenly. Siddharth was only 40 years of age. Initial reports have suggested that Siddharth had died of a massive heart attack. He was a wonderfully athletic, strong man who took exceptional care of his health, and the whole of the world is shocked that someone that young and healthy could succumb to a heart attack out of the blue. As we struggle to make sense of the chaos and emotional turmoil that Siddharth's unfortunate death has left us in, I thought I would share what I have learned about heart attacks from my own experiences as a practicing cardiologist. I wanted to dedicate this video to Siddharth and also pray for those that have been left bereft by his untimely passing, including his mother and sisters. We believe that most heart attacks occur because of a buildup of plaque in the heart arteries. Those people who have absolutely no plaque in their heart arteries are generally considered to be in a very low risk category. Why does plaque build up? Well, plaque builds up because of low-grade chronic inflammation. I'll try and explain inflammation to you. Imagine if I take a sharp knife and run it across my arm. The insult will stimulate inflammation. My arm will become red, it will become hot, it will become painful and become swollen. And once I stop insulting it, once I take the knife away, the healing process will start and slowly my arm will heal and the inflammation will subside and my arm will heal. This is acute inflammation. Let's talk about something which is far worse than acute inflammation and that is chronic inflammation. Now instead of a knife, imagine me taking a toothbrush and gently scraping away at my skin in one spot daily for the next 10 years. The insult is nowhere near as bad in the acute state as having a knife cutting across, but in the chronic state, because the insult is ongoing, it's low grade, my skin will never get a chance to heal. And in 10 years time, my skin will have changed in appearance and behavior, and it will be hard yet fragile, it will never be the same again. And this is chronic inflammation. Whilst a lot of people believe that heart disease is about cholesterol and blood pressure and diabetes, the reality is that these are perhaps surrogate markers and perhaps the big underlying villain is chronic inflammation. Now chronic inflammation can cause a buildup of plaque over a period of time which may then manifest with a progressive narrowing within the blood vessels. So the plaque builds up and then the plaque starts building around the vessels and slowly the lumen of the vessel gets narrower and narrower, and this will then gradually reduce blood flow to the heart muscle. And the way this will manifest for the patient is it will start causing something called angina, i.e. when the heart is working harder, it needs more blood, but because there is a restriction in the blood getting through, you will start experiencing symptoms of the heart not getting enough blood, and that is usually manifest with a tightness in the chest or a discomfort in the chest and breathlessness brought on by physical exertion and something that tends to get better when you rest. When you reduce the demand, the supply matches the demand, but when you increase the demand, because of this narrowing, the supply cannot meet the demand. Now, of course, if you leave this unaddressed, and let it get worse and worse and worse over a period of time, then that could lead to a heart attack. However, <coughs> this is not as terrible a situation as people may think, because when the patient gets this progressive narrowing, which develops over months and years, they get a warning. They get a warning in the sense that they start experiencing symptoms of chest discomfort, and they will therefore go and seek help. And the doctor will then say, okay, let's do some tests. They will have a look and they will find the narrowing, which is then treated either with a stent or a bypass operation. So in this setting, the problem, the, the thing is that although you have a problem, the problem gives you a warning and therefore you have enough time to go get it checked out and treated. 
Inflammation can also do something which is far worse than just causing a progressive narrowing. Some people may have just a mild amount of plaque, so the plaque isn't actually causing a constriction in the blood getting through and therefore will not cause any symptoms. But the plaque, for some reason, is unstable, meaning that the plaque is fragile, and what can happen is one day a bit of that plaque can break off. Okay, so the patient has no symptoms because the plaque isn't causing a narrowing, but because it's there and it's unstable, it may break off. And at that point, what will happen is that the body will think that there is a wound where the plaque broke off from and form a blood clot within minutes. And that blood clot inadvertently blocks off the whole of the vessel. And that is the mechanism behind sudden heart attacks without a warning. And it is most likely that that is what Siddharth had, where you know he had no warning, he was a happy-go-lucky guy doing everything right, and then just out of the blue, sudden heart attack. It is estimated that 50% of heart attacks present in this manner. Uh, and it is also true to say that the more inflamed we are, the more likely this is to happen. The next question is, let's say Siddharth had been checked out by doctors before this terrible event had happened. Could this have been prevented? And the answer is probably not. The reason is that we are very good at identifying plaque that causes the most narrowing, but we are not so good at identifying vulnerable plaque, plaque that is more likely to burst, plaque that is more likely to fall. It looks innocuous, it doesn't seem to be causing a major narrowing, but it may still be unstable. And the problem here is that because when you look at it, it just looks like a non-narrowed area of plaque, you can't do anything about it because it's not causing a narrowing. If you think about it, stents and bypasses can only really treat the most narrowed areas. They cannot be used as a treatment for vulnerable plaque that is not causing a significant narrowing. And the reason for this is this, that, for example, if you see an area which has some plaque but the blood isn't being restricted, then trying to bypass that area with a bypass, with another vessel to bypass it, is not going to work because blood will preferentially not choose to go down the bypass if it can go down its main way. Uh, and therefore the bypass will fail. So you cannot use bypasses. You cannot use stents for that because A, you, don't, you cannot identify which bit is going to burst when. And the risk here is that if you do try and fix something which isn't causing a narrowing, then you could potentially change a stable plug to an unstable plug. So in this setting, trying to do something like a bypass or a stent doesn't work. So the next question is, well, what do you do if you cannot identify which bit is going to break off when? What do you do? Can you use medications? Uh, because medications would work on everything, so why not use medications? And the common medications that we tend to use in this kind of setting are aspirin and statins. But it does not appear that they seem to confer a huge benefit in the primary prevention of a heart attack. They're much better at the secondary prevention of a heart attack, i.e. if you've already had a heart attack, aspirin and statin seem to confer more of a benefit to prevent a second heart attack rather than prevent the first heart attack from happening. In fact, if you look at the data, you would have to treat 1,667 people with aspirin for a year to prevent one non-fatal heart attack. And you would have to treat 83 patients on statins for five years to prevent one death. So the returns aren't really great from medications either. So the question is, when bypasses don't work for the situation, when stents don't work, and even when medications don't really offer good returns, what works? How do we prevent this from happening? And to try and answer this question, we have to understand what causes chronic inflammation. And to my mind, there are four main reasons. Number one, age. Number two, genetics. Number three, bad luck. And number four, lifestyle. Unfortunately, as you can see, we have no control over the first three. We cannot control our age, our genetics, and our luck. The only thing we have control over is lifestyle. But we should understand that we can lead the best lifestyle possible, but still have plaque build up in our heart arteries for any of the other three reasons. 
I think it's important to talk a little bit about lifestyle because really that's all we have that we can work with. And although there's plenty in the media about the importance of, a, of healthy nutrition and avoiding smoking, alcohol, etc., and exercise, there's much less information on two other aspects of lifestyle which are perhaps even more important. And that is one, lack of sleep, and two, stress. And I'll talk about these as we go along. I'll try and address all the lifestyle issues one by one very quickly. The first is nutrition. Nutrition is very important. And there is a lot more to healthy nutrition than just avoiding things like cakes and chocolates, etc. The truth is that the whole of the food industry is unscrupulous. And the food industry is not really motivated to cater for our health, but instead they try and cater to our tastes. Because if it tastes good, we come back and buy more. There are lots of aspects about nutrition that I wanted to quickly touch upon. And the first and foremost is sugar. Sugar is a major, major, major problem. And it is virtually in everything that we eat. And the problem is that we are constantly getting sugar hits all day long. And increasingly, we're beginning to realize that when we are taking more and more sugar all throughout the day, we are having to produce more and more insulin to try and get rid of this excess sugar. And our pancreas has to work harder and harder to produce the insulin. And it is now thought that perhaps this excessive insulin is what contributes to bad vascular health. This is termed insulin resistance. And, you know, if you ever get a chance, have a look about insulin resistance. It is a fascinating subject. And I truly believe that that is one of the major contributors. Insulin resistance is one of the major contributors to bad vascular health. In addition, I think there are so many other things that are wrong with the food industry. If we talk about farming methods, especially when it comes to animals, if you ever have had the misfortune to go and see how uh, an animal farm is run, you will be horrified. You will see what terrible conditions these animals have to face. In addition, the sole purpose of that animal's existence is to be made as fat as quickly as possible for it to render the most meat. These animals are fed the most unhealthy foods. They're, made, they're fed food to fatten them quickly. They're often pumped full of steroids. And they're always psychologically very distressed. These are not healthy animals. If we are what we eat, then it is not surprising to me why we put on weight and why we become unhealthy. And there's tons more, including processing, additives, pesticides. Um, one of the interesting observations I've made is when I was young, I had never even heard of food allergies. And now food allergies are rampant. And it therefore makes you question, it makes me question whether people are just becoming increasingly allergic to food or whether they're actually becoming more allergic to what is being done to our food even before it ends up on our table. And I'm going to do a more detailed video on nutrition. The second thing I wanted to talk about is exercise. And we're beginning to live an increasingly sedentary lifestyle. There's little doubt that exercise, however, is perhaps one of the most effective anti-inflammatory agents known. It is good for our physical health, it is good for our mental health, and we know that in general, if you study a population of people who exercise regularly compared to a population of people who don't exercise at all, then in general, we would expect to see the group that exercises to outlive the non-exercising group. There's also another very good reason to exercise. Let's say if you do have plaque in your heart arteries and that plaque is gradually narrowing the blood vessel, then exercising is increasing the demand of the heart and slowly the blood over a period of time will find another way to get it to its destination. Much like a motorway. So in a motorway, if you have a motorway that is having roadworks over a number of years, the traffic finds its own way to get to its destination. It bypasses the motorway. And in this sense, we can also form these natural bypass tracts. These are called collateral vessels. And by exercising, what we're doing is we're encouraging these collaterals to form. So the, the most narrowed segment is bypassed and blood finds its own way. The good news about that is if that narrowed segment eventually closes off and blocks the vessel, blood can still get through. And therefore, the amount of damage that is sustained when that blood vessel is blocked is much less 
if you have collateral uh, vessels compared to if you don't. And collaterals are encouraged by regular exercise. Collateral formation is encouraged by regular exercise. Uh, I think there are two additional points to make. One, I think exercise has to be done in moderation. Excessive exercise can also be unhealthy. Excessive exercise can also be inflammatory. So you come across some people who do crazy levels of exercise, you know, ultra marathons every weekend, etc. And that kind of exercise can be paradoxically quite inflammatory. I think the other thing to say is while exercise has a bad reputation, you know, everyone's terrified of exercise, the reality is it is unaccustomed exercise which is bad, okay? It is always good if you're planning to exercise to build up gradually and, um, and get used to it and do it in moderation. And those are all very good things for overall health. Another hugely important aspect of health is sleep. Sleep disturbance is an epidemic. In the Western world, it is estimated that as many as one in five patients suffer from underlying sleep apnea. And up to 85% of sleep apnea remains undiagnosed. People who have sleep apnea are at a higher risk of sudden death, they have a higher risk of heart attacks, they have a higher risk of stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, and even road traffic accidents. One in three people now have chronic insomnia, and many don't do anything about it. But instead, many will choose to mask the symptoms with large amounts of caffeine first thing in the morning. And actually, caffeine is just a mask. What they need to be doing is investing in their sleep and looking at why they're not sleeping well and meeting with a doctor and targeting it. A lot of people will pay attention to getting exercise, but very few people pay attention to sleep and improving their sleep. If you sleep better, you become a healthier person. And finally, and perhaps the most important component of lifestyle is stress. Stress seems everywhere, and even with all the advancements of technology, we are now more stressed than ever before. Everywhere we see, we are sold the message that you need to work hard, you need to play hard, then you need to work harder, and then play harder, and then you can buy more things, and when you buy more things, happiness is just round the corner. And people find themselves on this hamster's wheel where they're working harder, buying more things, accumulating more things, taking on more stress. And unfortunately, they accumulate lots of things, but they don't invest as much in their relationships because they're too hard work, they're working too hard, and they become more and more lonely, and they end up stretching rather than growing. And eventually people become more unhappy and they need more medications to make them happy. And unfortunately, they've never really realized that promise of happiness being just around the corner. So as you can see, the only things that we can really do, at least in the majority of us, to prevent a first heart attack is to try and live as healthy a lifestyle as possible. Unfortunately, this is the best we can do. And in some cases, even doing that is not necessarily going to prevent a heart attack. It is therefore important for us to realize that even with the best efforts, we really have no control over our length of life. Even if we do everything right to prevent a heart attack, that doesn't make us immune to having a road traffic accident or cancer or something else. So we don't really have any control over what's going to happen to us in terms of length of life. We do, however, have control over our quality of life. And we should all aspire to work towards improving our quality of lives. Our quality of life and our quality, our quality of lives can be improved by living a life of simplicity and moderation, investing in our health, obviously, spending time with our loved ones, and investing in our own growth. A lot of people come to me and say, look, you know, I'm worried I might have a heart attack in the future. I have two ch young children and I want to be there for them when they grow up. And my answer to them is, start off by being there for them now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. How can I predict what's going to happen to anyone else in the future? Uh, be there for them now. Live for the moment. And my advice to everyone I see after 30 years of medical practice is something uh, nicely said by Steve Jobs. And he said, Live each day as if it were your last, and one day you'll be proven right.
So I hope this is something that you find useful. Once again, it's a heartbreaking time and I can only pray for um, Suzuha's family and friends. And um, God is watching over his family and over the rest of us. Thank you so much.